Hello, we are now recording. Welcome to our third and final Pressbooks Publishing Pathway training for the OTN Publishing Co-op. Today we are going to focus on adding interactivity using plugins. Um, just a couple of quick reminders. I'm going to put the link to the Pressbooks Canvas unit in the chat. And then I'm going to put the link to our YouTube videos in the chat. And then at the end of today's session, I'm also going to put a link to a feedback survey in the chat. So if you could please let us know um, about your experience in these three trainings, that would be really helpful for us as we think about the next ones. And with that, I'm going to turn things over to Liz and Steele. Hi, Jonathan. And um, if anyone else has questions before we get started, feel free to, to chime in or turn on your video and wave hello. We are all friends here. Um, but if you don't have any questions before we get started, we will go ahead and get started. <laughs> so I'll, uh, I'll mute myself and um, turn things over to you guys. Thanks for being here. Fantastic. So I am probably going to kick us off and get us started here. <clears throat> Sorry, with a little frog in my throat. Uh, let me share my screen. And basically, as Karen said, the theme of this session is interactive features in Pressbooks. And I'm going to start off by showing some of my favorite features uh, that help to sort of extend the definition of what a book can be um, when you are creating this free resource for students on the web. And one of my favorite features is actually the text box creator. This was something that I think I requested a bunch of years ago, and eventually it came to be um, and I just love it. So if you are in Pressbooks and you are wanting to create a chapter, for instance, uh, in your materials, you can really structure that chapter very easily without having to do a lot of coding, which is something I like. So I'm just going to create a new ch chapter here. And let's say I want to kick this off with a learning objective or something like that. So I'm going to pick one of these uh, sort of pre-formatted text boxes. Um, it doesn't have to be the learning objectives one because I can edit the text of the headline, um, but there just so happens to be one all pre-built. So I could then say, um, here's what you're going to learn in this chapter, um, et cetera. And then change all of the text from the headline to the bullets to the main text in that and then I can go on with my chapter and, um, <clears throat> and let's say that we get to the end of my end of the chapter or further down the chapter and then I want to start doing more of breaking up the text again say I've put like this really huge wall of text and I again want to break this up uh, into more manageable chunks for the student so I might end this chapter with something like a key takeaway um, so again, I have this pre-built text box and I didn't have to do anything to make this pretty. All I have to do is essentially customize the text in the heading uh, and in the box itself, um, which is just a really nice way to break up that text. Another thing I like about this is if I didn't like this pre-formatting, uh, I could actually customize it uh, in most of our themes. So most of our themes have what are called advanced theme options. And the theme I have applied uh, does have those options. And what will happen uh, is that under global options, you will see a lot of ways to customize uh, those exercise boxes or key takeaways. So for instance, if I did not like uh, the background color for that box, I could change that. Um, so that's just one really nice, easy feature for faculty when you're creating um, a new resource. Another thing I love is the glossary feature. And hey, Liz, Liz, yeah. Just real quick, what I wanted to note is that what Liz just did was change the background color of that text box globally throughout the book. So if you had inserted multiple learning or um, learning objective boxes, all of the all of the box colors would be changed with one fell swoop, which is really nice instead of having to go find each of them and change them one by one. Exactly, exactly. And you could do that for if you were doing this like on an institutional network, maybe you'd want to change those background boxes to your school colors or something like that to brand the book a little bit more around your institution. Um, so just different things you might think of. Um, another feature I wanted to demonstrate was glossary terms. So these are easy to create. There's a couple different ways to create them. And actually, before I create one, let me show you what this actually looks like. Um, 
when you go to the web book, if you have some glossary terms set up, uh, when you click on those, uh, they will drop down with the definition that you've set up, which is a nice way, again, for students to engage with the text uh, and be able to understand um, more context about what they're reading. So if I wanted to set one of these up, I'm in a chapter with an example already set up, and you can see that there is some short code around this word, but I didn't have to know what the short code was. So I did not come up with the short code or type that out manually or uh, do any coding. All I did to set this up was highlight the term and click GL. And in this case, right here, I could create and insert a term or I could choose an existing term. And in this case, uh, that already exists, so I will just insert it. And Pressbooks inserts the short code to make that interactive. Another way I could add terms, let's say I have a bunch of terms to add all at once, um, and I just wanna add them into the book and then link to them that way, uh, I could go under glossary terms. And so here are a bunch of glossary terms that have been pre-populated, but let's say I want to add a new one. Uh, and we will call this particular term, uh, and that two words, uh, and then I would add the term, and then I would add my definition. And then I could even choose a different type for this glossary term, which would allow um, it to display in different ways. Um, that's a little bit more advanced, but what's really important is if you want to auto-populate a glossary later, you'll want to leave this checkbox checked. And this is what tells Pressbooks when you go to auto-populate a glossary, include this particular term in it. Uh, so I've created my term now. And so now that exists and I could add another glossary term if I wanted to. Um, in this case, I'm gonna show how to auto-populate that glossary of all the terms that have been added to this book. So what I do is I go to Back Matter and I can call this glossary anything. So it doesn't have to be called, you know, glossary. Um, and then all I have to do is leave this blank and then tell Pressbooks that this is a glossary back matter type. And then I press create, and Pressbooks pulls in all of those glossary terms that had the checkbox selected to show them in the auto-populated glossary. And so here you are, you can see, this is super helpful if you do have a lot of terms throughout your book and you want to um, essentially put those all in one place in addition to having those definitions in line. That's the glossary tool. Um, another thing that's really nice uh, is the notion of adding audio to the book. And I'll give just a quick example of that. I love this Portuguese textbook that was built out of UW-Madison. Um, they have included a little audio file of a dialogue in the Portuguese language, and then they've included a transcript of that afterward. So audio files are a little different than video files. With video files, Typically, any video file, even if it's like one minute long, is gonna be enormous. And we do not recommend that you use Pressbooks as like a video storage solution. It will just really eat up space very quickly, and it's not really meant for that. But usually, a short audio file um, is able to be uploaded into Pressbooks um, if you need to. And that's pretty easy to do. Um, you would just do that in the media uploader. And so I have a media file and audio file on my desktop. And this is the sound of an orca. It is a public domain. So I've uploaded that now. And then if I want to start crediting and attributing, in this particular case, I don't believe there was an actual artist on this. We don't know the name of the orca or the person who recorded the orca, but I could include that information here. Um, if this came from a particular album that needed crediting, if you had a caption, um, a description can be included. Um, and you can even, uh, essentially, you can even add more details under edit. So for instance, I think this is actually, Steele, is this a similar page to the other, or is it just that it allows you to format the description differently? Uh, we don't actually display the description anymore, but it, it okay. is similar, yeah. Okay, fantastic. Um, so then, and as you can see, this is 159 kilobytes, which is far less than you would have, like a video file might be, you know, five gigabytes or something like that. So I'm just gonna update that, and then that media has been stored in Pressbooks. And if you were in a chapter, uh, let's say we were writing a chapter about whales, uh, then 
you could link to that media. Uh, and here you would just add that media and you would go to the media library where it already exists and then you would insert it into the chapter and then you would create that chapter. And of course you can put text before and after all of this as well. So another thing that you can do that can make the text a little more fun is you can do things like embedding video. Um, and again, these are things you probably want to do from offsite because they tend to be large files. Um, so typically you might have like a video file that's uploaded on YouTube or Kaltura or Wistia or whatever uh, your institution uses or if you're linking to an external video. Um, and what you would do is when you're in a chapter, and again this can have text around it, uh, you would just include the link from YouTube to that video and Pressbooks expands it and makes it look as though it's embedded. And then when you go to that on the web book, it's a really nice visual in the middle of all of the text you might also be including. Another interactive element that you can add is FET simulations, and they work very similarly. Um, so FET simulations are these STEM simulations that have been done out of Colorado, and here is one example of those. This is one simulation, actually, I have to... And this is comparable to that YouTube link that I just copied and pasted. So I'm just going to take this link to the simulation, and then let's say I'm working in a chapter. I'm just gonna copy and paste the link, and again, Pressbooks will expand that so that it looks to be embedded. Um, the other thing that I wanted to demonstrate is H5P. Hey Liz, can oh, we, yes. pause, we pause for just a second? Yes. A couple of questions have come in on the chat, and I wanna mm -hmm. see if we can rewind before they get too far back. Definitely. So Jonathan asked earlier about the, the glossary. Mm -hmm. He said, so my understanding, when you make a glossary or a glossary list, there is no link back from the glossary list to where the terms are used in the book. Is that correct? I believe I, so. And I responded and said, no, the, the, the glossary term itself could be referred to many places in the book. And right now we don't have a way of indicating which chapters or multiple chapters a glossary term might be in use, but we'd be open to feature suggestions or ideas for how that looked. But right now, that's not a currently supported feature in Pressbooks. The second question um, was from Katie, who said, if I heard correctly, Liz, you said Pressbooks slows down if there's too much video or audio content on a Pressbooks chapter or page. Is that's, there not, that's not exactly what I meant to say. It's okay. more that it will eat up your storage um, if you were to try to upload videos. Um, videos are huge, and um, we do have a file upload limit. Typically, a video is going to be higher than that limit. Yeah, and just to clarify, so um, the there is a, for when we host Pressbooks networks, we cap the the fi per file threshold at twenty five megabytes. So most videos are going to be larger than that. Generally, you won't get very good performance by uploading a video and playing it from a website. It's almost always better to use a video streaming service. Um, many bro different browsers support different video formats and so a video streaming service will take a file convert it to the right thing behind the scenes and then serve it to the user in the way that they're expecting it um, YouTube and Vimeo are pretty well-known ones many campuses provide their own video streaming services so for audio images and other things smaller than 25 megabytes the method that Liz was showing to upload to Pressbooks is great when you get larger uh, and when if you're dealing with video it's almost always better to use a streaming service and embed um, which I think Liz showed how you could embed a YouTube or a Vimeo video. We could show that quickly if you want to see. Okay, and that's Katie's question. I think we covered everything. There was a little bit of chatter in the chat about whether non-humans can, can claim or hold copyright. It's still an open question in international law, but in the United States, at least, the, the federal judges have ruled they cannot. So if an ape takes a photograph, they cannot claim copyright, sadly, under the copyright law. Well, I have learned something. That is good to know. Um, so with that segue, um, we will do uh, some H5P quizzes.
Um, so HIP is a very cool tool that's available in Pressbooks EDU, and it will actually let you create a variety of interactive content. The possibilities are pretty endless. There's about 40 different things you can create with this. I'm going to show you, you know, a simple thing um, just to give you the idea. Like the most common thing is probably going to be quizzes that you're going to want to create, but you do have some options. So um, you could create flashcards um, for perhaps a language class or for something that has a lot of really important terms. Uh, you could create charts. You could create presentations. Uh, you can drag and drop. You can drag the words or fill in the blanks or do hotspots. Uh, there is there are games like a memory game. Uh, you can do different types of quizzes. The timelines you could do with this method as well. Uh, you could do different types of hotspots. This is another way you might upload an audio recording. You could do like a speak the words type of thing or <clears throat> like a dictation or even a virtual tour. So lots of possibilities here. For our purposes, I will demonstrate um, just a multiple choice quiz. Uh, and these are pretty easy to create. And they're a really easy way to, again, like sort of extend the book and make it a little more fun um, and approachable for students and also used, use these quizzes as sort of a way to reflect on and to self test what they've learned and if they've understood what they have just read. So Liz, Liz, before, yeah. you, before you jump into this, um, if people are doing this for the first time, what they would need to do at the book level is activate the H5P plugin. So there's a, usually a plugin menu on the left. You can see just like uh, three links down, it says plugins. You, once you activate H5P in your book, then this menu that Liz is showing you is available. And if you scroll a little bit slightly higher up, Liz, above, so for almost every activity type you choose, you'll see just where it says H5P multiple choice. Beneath that, there's two blue links. One of them is a tutorial and one of them is an example. These are provided by H5P to usually give you a template or a model for what this activity type looks like and does. And then the tutorial will kind of train you how to make one if it's a, if a more complicated type. So those are little helpful built-in guides. And Liz is gonna show you how to do it visually, but just wanna point that out. And there's actually a couple ways to create the H5P. Um, as Steele said, this is a per book decision. So you can turn it on on a particular book and it won't be on all the books on your network. Um, so just setting this up, all I really have to do is enter in um, some text for my question and then some possible answers. Um, I feel that the Groundhog's Day is quite relevant <laughs> today. Uh, Timely content, Liz. Well yes. So we're going to say that that is correct. I'm going to add an option. And let's say this is our third option. Well, well, and then I'm just going to save this. We'll, we'll offer extra credit for anyone who can explain <clears throat> the entomology of Punxsutawney. If anybody knows in the chat, we get extra credit. Okay, and so as you can see, again, Pressbooks generated this short code. So I did not have to develop the code here. It just appeared for me, and all I have to do is take this and put it wherever I'd like in one of my chapters. So for instance, let's just open a new chapter. And I'm just going to copy and paste this into the visual editor and press create. And then when we go to this on the web, that quiz will be visible um, as a quiz. And it's interactive, so I can take this quiz. Okay, um, I have set this quiz up where you could show the solution or retry it, but you don't have to. Um, so we could retry this. Um, there's also the ability to reuse this um, or to embed it. So for instance, when you are creating these activities, um, you are creating content that in theory, if you're making an open textbook and your intention is for these to be open, other people can also uh, essentially clone these activities as they clone your book, um, or they could essentially download them and upload them um, in different ways as well. So this content that you're creating is useful for all of the people who may one day use the book. I want to, and quickly, I want to share just a resource in the chat. This is one that's really meaningful to me. I think it's one of the best ones out there. A former graduate assistant of mine at the University of Wisconsin, who's now doing some really great work full time, her name's Naomi Salmon. And she built an OER source book in which we, she described a bunch of different kinds of interactive activities or components you can build, 
largely with press books, largely in H5P. And there's a bunch of different contextual ideas or ways that you could do common interactive learning things um, with Pressbooks H5P with lots of great examples and illustrations. And it's a terrific resource. It's openly licensed, published in Pressbooks. Take a look at that if you're curious or interested. And there's some, I think, really great in-depth and practical ideas. I think it's terrific. Fantastic. Um, the other thing I wanted to just mention is that you can also add H5P from the chapter. So I could have built all my H5P exercises at one time and then find them and insert them um, from the menu of H5P exercises in this book as well. So there are a couple different ways to do this. Um, I demonstrated the one I find the most intuitive, but you can approach this in different ways as well. And here is where you would also um, upload uh, if you were, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to stop that. Um, so at any rate, um, I think the next thing I'm going to demonstrate is the LMS uh, integration possibilities for Pressbooks. But before I switch the screen that I'm sharing, um, do we have any questions on uh, the last uh, little bit? Steele? Any questions oh, in the chat? No, no questions from the chat. There, um, okay, some, there were some questions, but I believe they've all been answered. So super um, in the chat. So thanks. Sharing a different screen now. Oh, we do have a question that came in, of course. Jonathan asked, can H5P results be saved somewhere? Uh, and the answer is yes. And it's complicated. So um, for, for users that are logged in and authenticated, their results will automatically be logged and stored in the database for them. But most of the time, you're going to have users that are not logged in or authenticated. And so they're just visiting the public website, in which case, no, there's no tracking or storing of the user data. Now, um, if, we were to, if you were to do this via an LTI connection, or if you were to install a plugin that transmits learning analytics to a learning record store, there's two different ways that that information can be stored and transmitted. Um, and that's slightly outside the scope of today's conversation, but I'll talk with you more about it some other time, Jonathan, maybe. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Um, so talking about the uh, possibilities for integrating with the learning management system, um, this is something you could use in a couple different ways. Um, on all of our Pressbooks EDU systems, we have what's called the Thin Common Cartridge Export with Web Links, which is a common cartridge file that you can download from Pressbooks from the export screen and upload into your learning management system. And in this case, I'm using Canvas because they allow you to essentially set up a free, a free shell um, that I can use to demo this. And what this is good for is two things. The first is that it allows you to essentially break up this and use the book as the spine of your course in the learning management system. So for instance, if you want to tell students, here is my textbook, and you want to do more than just point them to the link on your Pressbooks network where they can get all the downloads of that book and they can navigate the book in lots of different ways and they can read it on their cell phone, but you would like to actually get this into the learning management system in a way that calls attention to, for instance, specific chapters. Or maybe you're just gonna use like a tiny piece of that book and you wanna only publish a few chapters and call attention to those. Um, that is one thing you can do with the web links version of the LMS integration. So for instance, some of these, um, everything came over, anything that was a part became a module in Canvas uh, and anything that was a chapter became a page in Canvas. And I can rearrange these things uh, in Canvas. I can add different interactive elements around them in Canvas or any learning management system. Uh, and then I can decide which ones actually show to the students if they're published or unpublished or I could remove this. Uh, but when I go to an actual chapter and click on an actual chapter that's being linked in this way, you can see that it's pretty clearly like an iframe embed. It's not very seamless, and in theory, students could easily click on this link and be taken back to that external link of the Pressbooks uh, textbook, um, which may or may not be what you want. But another thing that this is very um, good for is um, if you have other institutions, if you are surfacing your exports from Pressbooks on your webbook homepage and you want other institutions to be able to use the book, 
they would be able to download, if you've surfaced it, the Thin Common Cartridge Export with Web Links and essentially set it up in this way, where it is essentially an embed with an iframe that is used as the spine of the course. So it makes it somewhat useful to people at other institutions as well. The deeper LTI integration provides a thin common cartridge export with LTI links, as well as a connection between your institution's Pressbooks network and your um, institution's learning management system. And again, this is like, it could be Canvas or Brightspace or Blackboard or Moodle, uh, any of those. And this is a little different. This allows you to do the same thing where you're breaking up the spine of the book and using it to guide students through certain sections, de deleting or publishing or rearranging or adding things around it as you did before. But this is a little bit more seamless. So when you go to a chapter here, uh, from the full integration, it doesn't look as much as though it is an embed. And at the root level, you can do things like mute uh, the press books navigation. Uh, so again, students don't really know that they've you know left the LMS. They think they're viewing a piece of content that is in the LMS. And if there are things like H5P exercises in this content, uh, students can do them right from within this uh, this page. So the H5P exercises do still work, uh, just randomly dragging there. Uh, if you had, you know, hypothesis enabled, you'd be able to engage with those annotations. Uh, the other thing that this thin common cartridge with LTI links is good for is if you have private content that you're looking to deliver to students only through the LMS and you need a way to format that content. So for instance, maybe you have a course reader you're building out of copyrighted content. Uh, that can be something where you can't make it public on Pressbooks on the web for copyright reasons, but you can sync it to the course shell in the learning management system with the full LTI integration. So students can see it in that walled garden without it being public on the web. Um, there's also the instant sync ability. So uh, essentially if you make changes on the Pressbooks book, those are reflected immediately uh, in the learning management system uh, with that LTI integration. And I guess I'll, I'll just pause there to see if there are any questions or still if you want to add anything to that. Uh, well, just two things. So Jonathan had earlier asked, is there a way to get results from the H5P activities? This is the way essentially that results will be coming. So right now we're at work on adding grade passback and learning analytics reporting to the LTI the integration. And so because you're doing it from within the LMS, the user already has an authenticated session. And in these cases, what would have happened would be when Liz just clicked those three things, Pressbooks and the LMS knows that it's Liz. And so we can tell the LMS, Liz scored a one out of three, or Liz did X or Y or Z. And so that's something that people have been requesting and asking for for a while. And so we're going to be doing providing that through LTI. Um, and then the other thing that is helpful not in your cases, because I think many of you are committed to open, but there are some instructors who say, I want to display private content or all right to reserve content or this content I publish with Pressbooks, but I don't want it on the public web. The LTI connection allows private content to be displayed within the walled garden. And so that's, that there are situations where that's desired or helpful, though not in an open publishing context, which I think is what the open textbook network's committed to. So, um, for good reasons. Um, the other question that came in from Cheryl was, uh, with the Silver Pressbooks EDU plan, does the LTI integration cost extra? And I replied and said, yes, that it does. Um, Liz, if you wanted to add anything to that, you're welcome to. For the LTI integration is an add-on. Um, so that is something, it is not included in the Silver. The Silver one includes the Thin Common Cartridge Exports with web links, uh, the first scenario I demonstrated, um, which is still helpful, but it doesn't go um, as far as that LTI integration does now and will soon. Okay, so if there are no other questions on this piece, I'm gonna hand this over to Steele uh, to demonstrate some of the more advanced interactive features. Let me stop sharing my screen. There we go. Thanks, Liz. I'm gonna share my screen here. I don't know if these are necessarily more advanced. I think H5P is about as advanced as it gets, Liz. But the first thing I wanted to show is in the case of an open textbook that I've cloned or copied. 
there are some people that say, hey, I've made a revision to this book and I want to compare how it looks to the original. So I think we showed you earlier that on the home page for a cloned book, you will automatically include a book source notification. So in this case, it's telling me that this book is a cloned version of Liz's original and that it may differ from the original. Well, I might want to know how does it differ from the original. And so in Pressbooks, a user can go to their theme options and click on web options. For cloned books, there's a tool that says source comparison. So again, I went to the books dashboard, appearance, theme options, web options, and I enabled the source comparison. Once that's enabled, what you'll see is on a chapter, at the bottom of that chapter, you'll see a little tool here. Sorry, I already expanded it, so let's pretend I hadn't expanded it. <laughs> There's a little tool that says show the comparison with the original. If I expand this, then what you'll see is this is going to compare my book that I'm looking at right now with the current version of the original. And you can see in the original, I had deleted the text that's red and I've added this green text. So I made a couple of changes to the opening two paragraphs and you can see them side by side to see what's changed between the original and the clone. That can be helpful at times to kind of look and see what revisions have been made to a clone book if you want. Um, the second kind of uh, thing that I wanted to show is one of my favorite things that has to do with teaching. And this has to do with uh, open web annotation. So uh, just as we can publish and use web tools to publish primary text or main body text in like a canonical way on a website, there's now a standard supported by the W3C for web annotation, for open web annotation. Annotation is a fundamental learning practice. All of us have written in the margins of books. All of us have taken notes to ourselves. And all of us, at some point or other, have probably seen someone else's annotation and laughed at it or wanted to share it or been like, oh, wow, marginalia, how interesting. The cool thing that we can do with annotation is that we've baked in an integration with another open source tool that we really admire called Hypothesis. Hypothesis is an open source annotation tool that's natively integrated now with Pressbooks. If you'd like to turn it on for your book, you come in to your book, you come down to settings, and you click the hypothesis setting, and then you'll see a bunch of different options or choices. In this particular case, we're gonna just say, allow it on parts and chapters, front matter and back matter, which means in those pieces of Pressbooks content, use the hypothesis client, which will look like this. Here's a book that I published with Pressbooks. It's about the Wisconsin poet, Larry Niedeker, a beloved poet. I wrote my dissertation largely about her. And here you can see, if you, I think you can see, but it's faintly highlighted in yellow. This is an annotation. On the right-hand side of the panel, there's an annotation pane. So if I were to click this button, I would see, oh, the pane has expanded. And this on the right-hand side is Hypothesis. It's an annotation tool. The user didn't have to install anything in their browser. They didn't have to, it just works with Pressbooks. As I'm reading the book, if I were to select new text, it would also have this little option that says annotate it or highlight it. If I were to click annotate, again, the annotation tool would pop open and it would provide me with a little panel that allows me to annotate whatever I've just highlighted and selected there. You can see this annotation layer is pretty interesting. This is a public annotation layer. Um, if you don't, if you would like to make annotations, you would need to create a hypothesis account and log in. But if you want to read annotations or just view them, you simply just look at the public layer to see what annotations there are. In this case, I could view all the annotations for a book. And in this particular case, there's 20 of them, and I can see there's a textual annotation here that's anchored on the word Lorraine Niedeker. Coming down here, there's an annotation that has an image in it, or a, sorry, a link in it. If I go down even further, here's an annotation with the reply. So someone's talking about Abraham Lincoln, and another person has replied and included a YouTube video that's been pulled from YouTube. So that video's not there anymore. Um, down below, there's an, an image that's been dropped in an annotation. So someone's talking about the book, New Goose. Here's the cover of that book from a library. And here's the title page published in the 1940s. Someone else is talking about the place called Paw Paw in Illinois. And here's a historical marker that talks about the, the war that Nidaker is referencing here uh, between uh, white settlers and native peoples in, in the poem. And here you've got a, another set of replies. Here's a video. We're actually serving up the pop. This is about pawpaw paw fruit, and she's talking about a pawpaw paw plant. So someone's showing you how to cut and prepare pawpaw paw fruit. Here's another link, and here's an example of an audio element that's been included in the annotation layer. 
This is Lorraine Niedeker reading one of her poems. For closure. Now I'm to take my bare walls down. My All of those things live comfortably here in the annotation layer. And what's nice about this is that you can imagine how students or readers can enhance and improve and contribute to our understanding of the main body of the text or do learning activities there in the annotation layer. Each annotation can be replied to, so it can be social. Each annotation also has a link. So for example, if a student had a question about Lincoln, and I could say, oh, go to the second paragraph, fifth line of the stanza, or I could just say, I made this annotation to explain it to you. I could copy this URL, I'd send it to you, you'd open that URL and it would take you right to the chapter, it would take you to the spot in the poem, and it would open the annotation and highlight it for you saying, this is what I want you to focus your attention on. The second thing that's really nice about this is, I'm just showing you the public layer. Each text, if you're using Hypothesis, can have multiple layers of annotation. Some that are public and some that are private. So I might use this for learning within a class that's only open to members of this class. So for example, I've just switched the annotation layer to my English class. And you'll notice the first set of annotations and highlights went away, and a new set of annotations appear here. These are the ones that are available in my private English class. They're only visible to my class. And only members of the class can make these annotations. If I teach another class the next semester, I might use a different layer that's totally fresh. Or I might say everything could happen on the public layer. We want to do this all out in the open. All of those layers can exist simultaneously on the same work at the same time. And that's a really nice feature uh, when we're thinking about how to do social learning around an open text. So that's the annotation tool. I don't know if there are any questions or things that came in the chat, but I will jump on to the next thing if that's annotation. That's hypothesis in a nutshell. Another thing I wanted to highlight in this chapter is this little note right here. This is a footnote. So in Pressbooks, you can create footnotes. If you notice, if I hover over the footnote, there's a tooltip that pops up and tells me what the footnote is, or I click the link and it jumps me down to the bottom of the text where there is a footnote, and this link would jump me back up to the footnote itself. To create footnotes, let me get into the editing interface. Okay, sorry, I got a sign. Okay, here I am, I'm logged in. No, I'm not. I'm, oh dear. One of these will be my account. Okay, great. Uh, where is my need to curl on? Okay. Here in this chapter, you'll see I've made a footnote. If I want to make a new footnote, let's say I want to talk about Niedek one of Niedeker's favorite poems, I simply find the footnote button, click the footnote button, and type my content here. I'm a new footnote, and click OK. What Pressbooks has done is made a little short code with the content inside of it. And then I could add a link or add other content inside of that footnote spacing. To show you what that looks like, I'm going to preview this and you'll see, oh, the numbering automatically was updated. This is now the new footnote. And here's the second one. The numbers got updated. The footnotes have been replaced. And it'll take care of and manage and maintain your footnotes for you just by using that little footnote tool and or the short codes. Um, that's kind of footnotes. That's a pretty common feature. If you'd like to display them in your exports, as EndNotes, that's available in your export options for PDFs. So you can choose whether you display them as footnotes in a, in a book or whether they all display as EndNotes when you're making PDF exports. The next thing I want to show you are, are the ability to embed some cool interactive things. So for example, um, I use, there's a really nice tool, the Knight Foundation, Knight Lab uh, is what they're called. They are a project out of Northwestern University in the journalism school. And they've built a tool called Timeline JS. Um, it's an open source tool that lets people make beautiful timelines. And so you can make different timelines and display interactive content on it. This website teaches you how you can make timelines. They also have another tool called Story Map JS, which lets you make story maps. If you've made a story map or a timeline using this tool, we allow you to embed it really easily. So I made a particular timeline about Lorene Niedeker, this poet, and let's say I'd like to add it to this chapter here. What I would need to do is come in here and I would paste the URL from my timeline and it will automatically turn that URL into an embedded timeline. So let me save this and show you what it looks like. So it detected that it was a timeline link. Oops. Uh, and here on the chapter, Underneath it, 
here's my timeline. It's kind of crunched a little bit. I should have changed the sizing a little bit, but you'll say, here's where Nita is born. Here's where she graduates from high school. Here's where she attends Beloit College. Here's where she's working at her public library. She gets married, they divorce. She gets published in this, she reads a magazine. She meets an important poet. Like, so we're working through the timeline and we're learning more about this particular person. It's a fully interactive timeline that's been embedded there in Pressbooks, but made elsewhere. You can also embed um, other sources. If you'd like to embed content via iframe from other external sources. So generally what will happen is we will say, Pressbooks has a pretty narrow whitelist of sources that we trust and we'll let people embed content from. Otherwise, we'll strip out iframes because iframes aren't always what you want people to be dropping in their books. But as a network manager, you can decide, I want to allow iframes from any number of sources. And so network managers can produce a network whitelist. For example, when Jonathan mentioned earlier this question about monkeys holding copyright, I found a story in NPR, and it's an audio. 28 seconds. Good morning, I'm Steven Spiegel. And I say, oh, this is really interesting. I'd love to embed this little audio player in my book about copyright for non-humans. Here in the, in, in, at NPR, they produce a little link that lets me take an iframe and embed it elsewhere. If I wanted to, in the Pressbooks context, I'd come into my Pressbooks network. I'd ask the network manager, I'd say, hey, network manager, will you let people embed from NPR? And they say, yeah, I think NPR is trusted. I guess it depends on your political perspective these days, but I think generally we can agree that NPR is probably a trusted source. So we'll say iframe whitelist, add NPR as a domain. So this means anybody can embed content from the NPR website in their books. The network manager does that. I come to my test book. I'm gonna make a new chapter here and I'm just gonna say NPR story. I'll come into my text editor and I'll paste the iframe there. And then when I create the chapter and I view it, you'll see, I have this NPR story embedded as an iframe. Good morning, I'm Steven Skeep, an old idea says. In Pressbooks. You can do this with basically anything that supports the iframe standard, provided that it's coming from a trusted source and you and your network manager agree that that's a source they wanna let you embed content into your Pressbooks site from. Um, so hopefully, Jonathan, next time someone asks you about whether a monkey can hold a copyright, you can point them to the embedded story from your, uh, from NPR on your growing Pressbooks book. Now, I want to talk about another topic that I know is close to Jonathan's heart. This was something that um, he and other mathematicians have helped us think about, and it's how you represent mathematical expressions or chemical equations or other kinds of things using mathematical notation. So. There's a number of ways that you can express math on the web. The most common is probably LaTeX, and uh, another form of math is called ASCII math, and another form yet again is called MathML. There's three different ways of representing math in, on the, in different typesetting formats. At Pressbooks now, we've added uh, native support for all three of those uh, syntaxes or input structures, and we're gonna render all of them in the web book using something called MathJax. And MathJax is a JavaScript library that will produce generally accessible math in browsers. So for example, here's an algebraic expression chapter. You can see there's lots of mathematical expressions all throughout. When I click on this, you can see that I can highlight this text. And if I right click it, you'll see a MathJax interactive panel that has a number of accessibility features and other options available to a user. So the user could choose to see I want to see this expression as the math ML, or I'd like to see it as a set of tech commands, a lot tech. Or I could also say, when I double click this, I want you to zoom in 300%. So double click, ah, it's produced a little zoom feature for me. Or I could say, you know what, I'd prefer that you render this in some other way, either using HTML or math ML or SV, an image or whatever. So there's a lot of different options that the user has for how they see this math display for them. Um, in Pressbooks, the way that you would create math um, is you'd come into your book and uh, let's, I, I don't, okay, this is on a test network, I can add something. So I'm going to make a test chapter. And you can do it one of two ways. You can either, I'll show you the settings page where it explains this. There's a number of different syntaxes that we support. So if you'd like to use the short codes, which is most common, you just enter a shortcode that says LaTeX, 
enter the math expression, enter a closed shortcode that says LaTeX there. Or you can use this syntax, which is dollar sign LaTeX, and it closes with a dollar sign. To use ASCII math, these are the syntaxes supported. To use MathML, you can just use the math markup, and we'll try to convert it. So for example, if I wanted to express this expression, which is, I drop in that LaTeX, or let's do something pretty simple. Let's say it's a, just a simple binomial expression, or trinomial as the case may be. And let's view the chapter. Oops, I did something wrong with my second one. I don't know what I did wrong, but let's just show the first one uh, rather than troubleshooting it live. Okay, I have a LaTeX equation. And hopefully when I view the chapter, you'll see this has been converted into math jacks. It's accessible and viewable in the browser here. The other thing that will happen is that when you make an export format, um, Pressbooks will take this expression, turn it into an image with alt text, and put it in your export format. Because PDFs can't use JavaScript, most ebook formats can't use JavaScript, and this solution relies on JavaScript to render and display. So we have a kind of nifty solution where we're automatically going to generate images and put them in the exports for you. So it still looks like math for the user. I know that's probably a little bit in the weeds for some of you who don't think a lot about math and mathematical quotation. And for others of you, it's not enough in the weeds. So um, maybe that's the right balance for now, and we'll see if there's any questions. Jonathan, how does it create the alt text? Of course there's a question. OK. So uh, the way that it creates the alt text is it puts, if you're using LaTeX, it just enters the whatever the LaTeX expression is, is the alt text for the image in question. So um, I don't know if I can, maybe I can give you an example if I change the, the rendering. I'm, I'm going to test this live. I don't know if this will work. but. Okay, I've made it as an SVG, and now when I inspect this element, you're seeing here's an SVG. Does this have alt text applied to this one? This is the MathJack solution rather than our solution, but what we would do is we would say, what's the underlying LaTeX expression? Add that as an alt text to the image, um, and that's how it does it. And Jonathan says, oh, cool. So hopefully I satisfied him and he would answer it. Excellent choice. Thank you. <laughs> We tried. <laughs> and then Cheryl asked, what about for linguistics content? That's a great question. So when you're doing uh, linguistics notation, it depends. So if you're using uh, mathematical characters and you want to set it in LaTeX, you're more than welcome to use LaTeX. Many times, though, for linguists, my understanding is they're just using uh, special Unicode characters from the regular character set that has a special name and representation. So for example, you might say, I want to include a particular symbol, you'd come to the special character list. I don't know if the schwa is included here, for example, but like here's the ligature OE. I've just created that character and inserted it. So I think it really depends on what kind of character they're trying to insert and what their need is, but many special characters will be represented here. And if you were to look, the text would be represented there. And if you needed to, you could enter the Unicode or the the particular character value and it should represent an HTML, I think. I hope that answered the question you were asking, Cheryl. If not, I'm happy to follow up. Okay. Um, the, so that's MathJax and that's LaTeX. That's how we do math notation. We're always trying to improve that solution. Jonathan has a couple of pending feature requests for us that we're still thinking about and trying to figure out. We do want to get to it and we want it to make it better, but now it's at least minimally functional. <laughs> The, the next thing I want to show would be uh, you can create tables using a little built-in table creator, but there's also a tool that you can activate in your book. You can import, uh, you can turn it on. It's called uh, Table Press. So if you activate the Table Press plugin, you'll see a little interface here that lets you build or import uh, and display interactive filterable, filterable sortable tables. So in this book, I've activated Table Press. And I can create a new table. So I'm just going to say add a new table. I'm going to call this fake table. This is a demo table. And I want it to have, let's see, four rows and three columns. So it's making a table. And then I can add the content. So I will say name, color, number of books. Let's say favorite color. Uh, and I'll say steel, pink, 17. And I'll say, Karen, Karen, favorite color? Do you want to share? I know that's personal. Let's go with gray. Gray. 
I don't know if I spelled that the English or the American way, but I spelled it. Uh, and then uh, anybody else want to suggest their favorite color? Jonathan's first on the draw here. Purple, and we'll say 71. So I've created a basic table here. There are a number of interesting and uh, advanced feature options to how the table can be manipulated, how you want the table options to be displayed, whether the table has a header. In this case, yes, I want that table row to be the header. And I want them to have alternating colors so that it's sortable and easier to see over long term. And then I want to show the table name above the table and the description below the table. And I want to do all these other fancy things. I'm just going to leave the defaults. I'm going to say save changes. What has happened is Pressbooks has now created a table with this short code. I come into my book and I come to chapter one and I say, let's put a table. And I will say, save this table. Now, when I'm ready to view the table, you'll see, ah, Here's the table I just made. It's showing 10 entries at a time. I want to search for everybody's name or every entry that has the letter E in it. And all of them have E. But let's look for ones that have LE. Oh, it's just the one. Or let's sort by the number of books. Jonathan's in the lead. Let's sort by alphabetical character by favorite cover color. So what we have is a sortable, filterable, dynamic, searchable table here. In the export formats, we'll just convert this to a flat, accessible HTML table. But in the web book, you've got sortable, filterable content. Um, you can put mathematical expressions and other things in the table. And you can also import a table from a CSV file. So I've got an, a demo file here. This is just money, like an accounting type table here. So dates, assets, debts, and net. I grabbed it from an open source spreadsheet online. And I'm going to create this. So I've just imported a CSV file within a couple of seconds and made a I don't know how many row, 102 row table. Let's display um, 55 of them per page. So it's gonna have pagination in it. Grab my table thing, let's edit this. And we'll put a new table down below. And let's take a look and see what happened there. Here's my second table. And I could search, I only want to see Decembers. So over the last eight Decembers, here's the trend. Or I could say, let's sort by when things were at their best. Oh, November, they were doing well. Way back in November 2011, they were not doing so well. They were in the red. And I could say, let's actually show 100 entries per table. I can see the whole thing now. Or I could say, let's go 10 and let's look at pagination here. So all this is happening dynamically in the web book and then would be converted to a flat table in the exports. Um, so there was a great question. Do you know if there are any additional accessibility measures to think about with this or the standard table function? <laughs> yes, great question. Tables can be very accessible. Tables can be accessible or they can be very inaccessible depending on how they're used. So there's a bunch of general guidelines for table creation. Um, Boise State has put together a, a really excellent set of guidelines specifically in reference to the table press plugin that I think are pretty good. So they have some good guidelines for which of the table press features are most and least accessible. Generally though, a well-formed uh, interactive table should be accessible and meet some of the guidelines. If you uh, use it as intended, you probably don't wanna merge cells and combine cells and do other kinds of things. If you, if other kinds of things you'd wanna do would be declare table headers, use the footers appropriately, um, and make sure that you display uh, titles, descriptions, those kinds of things. As long as things are clearly labeled um, and you're using the cells as intended, tables will generally be accessible in the browser. Okay, so that's uh, the tables, interactive tables. And um, the last thing that I wanted to talk about are a couple of exciting things that we're working on or thinking about in the future. The first of them is right now, if you want to find out about cool, interesting press books that have published, that have been published, you sometimes have to go to individual press books networks. You have to know where they're at. So for example, I happen to know Ohio State has published a bunch of really interesting textbooks. So I come to their website and I view their complete catalog and I can say, oh wow, here's a great book about choosing and using sources. Terrific book. It happens to be in the open textbook library, so I could have found it there. But if I come back here and I pick, um, 
I think flipped through design. I don't know if this one one of the books earlier I looked in is not in the open textbook library. That's an oversight on their part. They should add it to the open textbook library, but I have to go to this website and know that it exists. Even worse are things like when I go to the Wisconsin network, I happen to know like because I worked here, this catalog only has a handful of books, but there are lots more published books that are not listed in this catalog. You have to know about the URL to know they exist. And that's a little bit nuts. So what we're working on um, is, yes, you're right. There was an MD license. That's probably why it wasn't in the okay. Okay, good catch. Um, the, 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 the thing that we're working on is we would, we're, we're working on building a massive public directory of all known published Pressbooks content. And the way that we're doing that is right now, we have an API tool that shares information about books on the network. It's what we use for our cloning routine, for example. I'm looking at a, a view of a bunch of JSON, which is kind of human readable, but kind of not, from a sample network. Right now, I can go to this network, and this will tell me all of the books on a given network. So for example, here's a sample book. Here's its name. Here's its headline. Here's the description. It's in English language. Here's the license it's, attributed, it's been attributed under. So what we're doing is we're going to go out and, and grab from the API all of the metadata about the published books, and we'll build a search interface and display interface that would let anyone in the world say, search across as many Pressbooks networks as are interested in participating to be able to find and identify books quickly. We don't think this is going to be a replacement for the, the really great resources like the Open Textbook Library or like, uh, I don't know, SUNY's got their search tool. and. George Mason has their search tool. There's a bunch of different repositories and aggregators and search tools. But what we do want to make is an easy to find and use Pressbooks directory that you can then quickly clone or, or copy content from. Um, and so that's something that's in progress. And we hope that we'll have something to share that's releasable by mid to end of March. Um, and we're pretty excited about that. Earlier in the presentation, Liz and I talked a little bit about what we're planning to do with the LTI improvements. If people are curious, right now, there's been a recent upgrade to the LTI specification standard. Um, so the old standard was LTI 1.1. They did try a 1.2 and a 2.0, but they abandoned them and said, actually, we're going to go from 1.1 to 1.3. So 1.3 is now the new stable LTI standard. We're very close to having updated our LTI plugin to the new 1.3 standard. And in the near term future, we're going to add support for grades and outcomes reporting um, or assignment reporting to the LMS from interactive activities like H5P inside of a Pressbooks chapter. So that's exciting, I think, for us and for people who are thinking about building courseware inside of Pressbooks or interactive content. Uh, and that's in the, on the near-term horizon for us as well. And um, I know we've talked a lot, so we can leave the last couple minutes for questions. There's not much time left. Literally the last two minutes. Okay. <laughs> no, but you uh, have incorporated questions throughout. Everyone's had um, great questions and feedback in the chat. If there are additional questions and you want to try to squeeze those in, um, you are welcome to them. But I will start our wrapping up the hour conversation, uh, which uh, we'll start with a thank you to Steele and Liz for joining us and sharing all of this great information. I learned a ton and um, I'm really excited about all of the different features. I would also like to share that feedback form I mentioned. Um, so if you can please, in the last minute or before the end of the day, just let us know how this was for you. If there are topics you would like us to revisit, things that we didn't cover that you really wish um, to learn more about, this is a way to let us know. So. Um, please do share your feedback. I know you get a lot of survey forms, but um, they're really helpful for us as we plan programs. So that's it from me. And I see the thank yous coming in. So I will adjourn. And uh, thanks again, Steele, Liz, and Pressbooks. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye.